before those uh, corks start popping. So I wanted to say a few quick thank yous. First to Dolores Lecky for being here. It's so good to see you. Um, we've had several of our electeds either here or rolling through. Libby Garvey was here, I know. Walter Tahad is here, and I saw Jay Fassett come in, and I hope I didn't leave anybody else out. But thank you for being here. I, can't, I, I don't have my glasses on. Jay. I said Jay, yeah. Um, I forgot my glasses, but I remembered everything else, so hey. I'd like to thank my good pal Michael Shea at Arlington Independent Media and his crew for being here, because they've taped it in its entirety, so we're very pleased with that. Thank you very much. Also thanking a lot of our financial sponsors who are represented by various people, Walter, um, Webdale from AHC, I know G Nina Janapal is here, or was here, and Linda from APA, Caitlin Geary-Jones from the Geary O'Hara Family Foundation, Mike Scheuer and his colleague Jose Paez from VHDA, Craig Pasco, BBT. I also want to thank the guys at uh, Arlington Transportation Partners for coughing up these really nice bags. I kind of threw a Hail Mary email out there and they stepped up for us. And I want to issue an apology because this has been kind of like an afternoon of speed dating, if you will, about, uh, yeah, so I thought it was really smart to, oh, let's just do one topic this year. And then I started getting into it. I'm like, uh-oh, once again, I have made huge scheduling mistakes. So if you're mad about the lack of questions, lack of question time, it all comes right here. The blame is right here. The one thing I will say is we give out good materials, and any of the uh, presentations you didn't get will be on our website. So you can go back and look at stuff and absorb it. But it's a big topic, so uh, thank you for being here. So our last two, uh, two panelists both have really extensive experience in housing. Walter Webdale is the president and CEO of AHC Inc. He built the most recent committed affordable senior independent living facility in Arlington. He's going to describe it and identify barriers to replicating it. Um, I'm also just going to introduce Hunter right now. Hunter Moore has a uh, senior housing track record that spans multiple sectors. Currently, he is Senior Operations Director at Culpeper Garden. He's going to describe an important zoning issue, and we were talking about what are some of the barriers here that we have to address if we're going to get serious about you know, aging in our communities, especially with our, this boomer wave, of which I'm a part. And he's also going to talk about the problem of what he calls islands of accessibility. So, Walter. Okay, thank you very much. It is a real pleasure being here. Uh, I'm going to be walking through a development that we did, what is, it, it was 10 years ago, one of the first developments, in fact, the first senior development that AHC did uh, here in Arlington. Right now, uh, AHC has about 600 units of elderly housing that we manage, but 74 of those, only 74, are here in Arlington itself. And part of today's uh, program is to identify some of the barriers that we've had and some of the things that we might look forward to in the future. Uh, this is Hunter Park. It's on Lee Highway. If you know where Cherrydale Nursing Home is, uh, this is right across the street from it, and the Safeway is on the other side of, of Lee Highway. It's a pretty vibrant living environment. As you can see, as I mentioned, it, it opened up 10 years ago, 74 one-bedroom units. 80% uh, of our tenants are still there. They've been there since the beginning. The average age is now 75, which means people uh, moved in at age 65. Uh, we have a lot of participation in our activities that go on in the building. Many of the things that you heard about from previous speakers, uh, we can walk to shops. There is plenty of public transportation, and there are resident services programs. Uh, there is a little uniqueness to this development. It is modeled on something I did before coming to Arlington, and that is the units themselves are one bedroom and they are small. On the first floor is, quote unquote, the community space. As you can see some pictures, two of the pictures are the indoor community space. This community space is set up not like a rec room like this that you can switch around to various things. It's literally set up as a library, card room, dining area, kitchen area. It's sort of a super first floor of somebody's home. And the whole idea is to get our tenants down, uh, to use that space for those kind of uses that they themselves organize within that space. 
Also, over and above the lobby at the front door, uh, you can see the roof garden. Uh, so there is outdoor space, planters, and other activities that go on there. To get to and from the spaces, the first floor is the community area. It is not open to the public. It is strictly for those who live there. There is also a grand staircase that takes you to the second floor. There, there are elevators, by the way. Uh, that is another lobby where you can do other things, such as computer work or just socialize privately uh, with, with friends. Uh, these are kind of some of the activities that we have going on uh, within the, the, uh, the development itself. Uh, a lot of community partners, and these are the people who supply these things. We have a manager. Uh, we have a lot of help from the county in uh, designating what programs are available. But it's really our tenants uh, get themselves, they actually begin to organize and work with these groups to make sure the activities are continuing in the, in the building itself. Uh, who can afford to live there? Well, five of the units are at 30% of the median income. And I've <clears throat> These units were specifically designed to help a very low income group and they were funded by Neighborhood Works, which is a federal uh, chartered program. Uh, we have 10 units that are at 50% of the median income, which means 37,000 and 60% uh, make 45,000 a year, or the, that's where the unit is pegged. But as you can see below, those are the rents that are on the books, but how can the people who are actually living there afford it. And they afford it by their 32 of the units are rented with people with Section 8 vouchers. Uh, 31 of the units have tenants who get a housing grant from Arlington County. And we only have 11 units who, where the people actually fit into the 50 or 60 uh, median income category. This is what it was. It was an electronics store. Uh, there was a dog grooming service in there, and uh, it wasn't exactly a, uh, the greatest corner in the Cherrydale neighborhood. Uh, and you can see the after that, uh, that we brought about. The ground floor still is commercial. Uh, we always get mocked because of the tenant we got on the ground floor. It's a mattress company. But <laughs> we, we, we do have a spa there as well. But it was a little hard getting Starbucks in because they happened to have a they happened to be across the street, and they didn't feel like moving out of the Safeway. Uh, the original plan called for demolishing, buying what you saw, and then demolishing a couple houses that were back in the neighborhood. And this is where the real challenges begin. Although many people would say, yes, the strip commercial along Lee Highway wasn't exactly the greatest looking building, uh, but now you're talking about replacing that with density, that dirty word. Uh, and you're talking about taking some single family homes and changing them from single family to multifamily. You are encroaching into the neighborhood. And when we, when we do all of these, these things, we then say, how much density can we get? Because we had to buy single family homes, we had to buy. And we, what we'd like to get uh, is a concrete building, six stories high, which would have maybe 100 plus units. But we're also at that same time, as was brought up by other speakers, we start digging in the ground and at, to uh, build the garage for the, uh, uh, the cars that the tenants will have. Uh, we went through the process here in Arlington. We're amending the general land use plan, getting the rezoning. Uh, and this was the, f the first project that was done in Arlington under a residential project of this type was done under the what's called C2 zoning. Uh, we still had funding gaps as we looked at this, as we got more density, as we got uh, the parking requirements reduced. Uh, we had to reduce the size of the building because concrete is very expensive. It's much cheaper to build with stick building. Uh, we got the parking reduced down to, uh, instead of 1.125 spaces per unit, we got it reduced by the county to one point. Uh, I'm not one point, but 0.75 per unit. Next thing is we have to overcome financing. Uh, low income housing tax credits, uh, mentioned by other speakers, that, that covered uh, almost 5 million of the cost. A first trust, which is a, a mortgage, the first mortgage on the building. 
And then, thank God, Arlington County with a $2 million, what we call an AHIF loan, which is a silent second trust that we don't have to pay anything on until we refinance the building itself. And then, of course, AHC put a million, almost a million and a quarter dollars in the building itself. And you can see our partners there, uh, the county, the Enterprise Mortgage, Fannie Mae, Hudson Capital, they're people who sell uh, tax credits, NeighborWorks, who I mentioned before, and the SunTrust Bank, who did the construction loan. If you look closely at that picture, that is the front entrance, and you can just see a tree growing on the roof. That is the garden that I was telling you about. Um, and this just reiterates the, what we did build, and much of what I've already told you, how it was financed. Uh, and of course, we also always have to add that we won a prize with the building as well. Our challenges, the first big challenge right now are the tax credits. VHDA, the, the, uh, they, 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 in their housing programs, they are primarily trying to build for families. And so they do have a ceiling as to the number of units that they will finance with tax credits. So that means you are, <clears throat> there's a lot of competition across the state to get those tax credits because it's a very small package. The C2 zoning, it worked beautifully because at this particular site, we not only had C2 zoning, it was also in a revitalization area, which meant you could do some extraordinary things with the density that you can't do in general C2 zoning. Now, C2 zoning, that's a lot of Lee Highway. It's all sitting there, these, <clears throat> this commercial sitting on the edge of old neighborhoods where we would like to find tenants from and build new commercial space on the ground floor and go up in the air. But because it's not in a revitalization area, we cannot uh, replicate Hunters Park unless we could find a similar type lot. And then the parking. Parking is very, very expensive. Uh, of our parking spaces, we built, under the formula, we built about 55 spaces for the residents uh, we are presently parking 26 cars, some of which never move out of the garage. Okay, so <clears throat> we would look at possible incentives in increasing what you can do in any C2 zone, regardless of what it is, uh, more flexibility on the parking, and uh, we are prepared in all of this to continue the work and the relationship that we have with the Department of Aging in the county. Uh, these are the guys, this is, uh, these are the kind of people who live there uh, in some of their activities. And once again, the little roof garden you can see uh, <clears throat> in the picture on the left. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I am Hunter Moore, and I, uh, I appreciate being here. It's an honor to be part of the Leakey Conference, and uh, there, there's some been great panelists so far, um, and I agree wholeheartedly with almost everything that I've heard today, and I want to try to build on some of that um, based on my experience as a developer, owner, operator, but also from the county side, because I spent several years with Arlington County, and um, I have a couple of joint passions. For over 30 years, I've been involved in um, retirement housing, and uh, actually I'm at Culpeper now. I consulted for Culpeper, the first expansion of Culpeper back in the 80s. And um, the, the, I could go on for an awfully long time when I initially put together some slides. I had a lot of information. I was told I had 10 minutes, and then I was told I was near the end of the, the presentation. <laughs> now I understand I'm between you and wine, so I will be very brief and uh, try to focus on, on just two, two areas. Um, those are accessibility, and this is an issue that I, one of the last things that I was trying to look at while I was still with the county, and zoning. And uh, when I talk about accessibility, most people think about wheelchairs and walkers. I'm talking about how people get around, how people get from space to space and the challenges they have. Um, whether you're um, two years old or you're 82 years old or anywhere in between, we all have problems and challenges. At some point in our life, we break a leg, we have a baby carriage, we have a stroller, we have, have bags from, from groceries. And there are a lot of, um, my definition of accessibility is much more broad than many people think about it. And um, while we want to, um, we've talked a lot about the desire for keeping seniors in their homes, 
and that is what most people want, they have to be able to have access to the goods and services in their neighborhoods um, and in the commercial quarters. We do a very good job of that. And in, in the more residential areas, as you move further and further away from the quarters, it becomes more and more of a challenge. And I said, we do a good job in the commercial quarters, too. But um, one of the things that we were looking into uh, shortly before I left was, what happens in the commercial quarters when we develop a new building? We have great codes and great plans and great new buildings that um, are tremendously accessible. But when you walk down from the one portion of the quarter to another, and between them, you will see that many of the, the areas that have not been redeveloped yet have sidewalks with stoops going out into them, with mailboxes, with telephone poles. And actually, what we've ended up creating unintentionally are islands of accessibility and inaccessibility. And so when you talk about wanting to be able to keep people in their own homes and allow them to access all these wonderful things that are available even in the commercial quarters, there are a lot of challenges. And we looked at that and we looked at um, who else has looked at these issues and how have they comprehensively dealt with that. And guess what we found? No one. No one in the United States has come up with a plan. No jurisdiction has come up with a plan to look at comprehensively how you would make a commercial quarter available. As a matter of fact, Sao Paulo, Brazil was the only place that had one avenue where they actually had done this. The other things that we could look at were the Olympics. And the Olympics have done this not because of the athletes that are there for the Olympics, but the athletes that come after for the Paralympic events. And they've created whole villages, areas that are accessible from a walking standpoint, from a riding standpoint, from a visibility, from a hearing, from all of those issues that people as they age deal with, but the rest of us have issues as well. We heard from somebody from the Independence Center earlier. We're talking about a broad spectrum of people that have concerns and issues, and the question was, how do you deal with that? Nobody has come up with the answer yet, and the fact is, this is a very broad issue that is not, not easily defined, not easily tackled, and is one that I think over time we as a community are going to have to work together on. Um, the, the, they are, these are very real problems that most of us don't recognize until you get out there and start walking. And I would encourage you to even walk here. As you walk near the Boston Metro, walk across the street and look at the Boston Metro side and across the street side and you will see wonderful accessibility and an inaccessible sidewalk. Um, and so this is going to take a community-wide push. It's going to take um, issues like uh, Terry and I worked on visitability and, and trying to look at issues there. It's going to take um, incentive programs for people who aren't redeveloping their entire building to address these issues in, in, in their uh, sections of the commercial corridors. It's going to take uh, transportation dollars that are, are going beyond vehicular transportation but to pedestrian transportation because certain areas will not be done unless jurisdictions take them on. And it's going to take um, probably grants from other agencies and groups to look at this, um, both in the commercial quarters, which are great, but in the residential areas as well. Because, as, again, as you move further away, you run into things where sidewalks stop, where transportation, although it's great in the commercial corridors, is more challenging for many of the people as you move further and further away. And there are not neighborhood villages um, uh, to, to use uh, another term, but shopping centers accessible to a lot of people that are living in their own home, want to live in their own home, can afford to live in their home, but they can't easily access those services. Something like neighborhood villages is great. You heard that about 60% of their services is transportation, and that's because people are stuck in their, their wonderful home and unable to get out to those services, the amenities, the shopping that they need that's available here in abundance and great, but they are really locked into an island. And that occurs in a, in a very single home neighborhood, but it also occurs in the commercial quarters.
The other issue I wanted to talk about um, is I, one I think that's even easier to address, um, and that's zoning. And the zoning code, whether you've looked at Arlington County zoning code or not, it used to be very complicated and build sort of a pyramid. You knew one part and you had to read another part to understand the next part and back and forth. But in, two, in 2013, that was revised. It's much easier to understand now. It essentially allows the county to say what they want to have, where they want to have it. So the county board here can actually redefine um, areas and specific spot zonings where they want to, and that's, a, that's I know that's a, a, a bad word in a lot of areas, but specific areas where they want to change the zoning to encourage a certain kind of development. And they actually have done this in some broad areas, and I want to talk primarily about apartments and apartment buildings, not individual homes right now, because I think that's where the broadest opportunity for affordable senior apartments is going to be, or senior living options, senior homes is going to be. And I want to touch on the special overlay uh, areas, particularly those along Columbia Pike, because I think they represent a, a, an opportunity that could be replicated um, that are really strong opportunity for affordable housing, not only for seniors, but for, uh, for all of us. Um, the, the codes are, uh, the, there are also some codes that encourage and are designed for affordable housing. And I applaud the county for what they've done and um, that happened, a lot of that happened in about 2005 when I just started working with the county and I think they're really good, there are really good incentives um, and requirements of developers to, to um, increase the stock of affordable housing, but the question is, does it go far enough, and does it go far enough particularly for low-income seniors? Um, the site plans allow the county board to make the exceptions, uh, to achieve designs that are appropriate, and we've got a, a great board, and I, and I say that I would, even if you all weren't here, and I know three of you aren't here, but we really have a great board, and they are very receptive to good ideas. I think one of the things they maybe need is some help from the community, and this community in particular, on what more should they do? What more could they look at that would help encourage this wave that we've got of affordable, of senior, low-income seniors that are need housing? One of the things I was struck by one of the earlier speakers was they said 89%, um, and let's say it's 90%, because it's easier math for me, of the seniors in Arlington in 2020 are going to stay in their homes. And there'll be about 45,000 of them. That means there'll be about 10,000, 10 percent, uh, or about 4,500 that aren't going to be in their own owned home. And one of the other statistics they showed, and it was quick, and Terry presented it, was there are about a thousand right now, a little over a thousand, maybe a thousand two hundred apartments for seniors. So, 20, 24,000 people right now, a little over a thousand apartments. That's a big gap. And the question is, how are we going to bridge that gap? That's one of the things we're here about. Um, and frankly, I think we need to look at things beyond this 25% increase in density is great that you're able to get if you're building something that's not affordable and adding affordable. But we need to look at some things beyond that to, to really address the affordability. And virtually everyone's talked about parking so far. Um, and parking is one of those key issues. If you're talking about $50,000 for an apartment building, for an apartment, an affordable apartment, before you even build any of the apartment, that's just to park a car there, that's really very going to be prohibitive to making affordable housing. So, so what are the answers? I think there are a couple. Um, the zoning codes, that, as they are now, are based primarily, except in the form-based code areas, on a units per acre. That drives a developer, and I've been that, that person, to build a bigger, as big a unit as you can because it's how many, you're limited by how many units you can build on an acre. And so if I can only build 100 units, I'm going to build the biggest ones I can and get the biggest return I can. Um, however, on a unit-based basis, like the form-based code allows, we're talking about the envelope of a building. The community decides, 
I want a six-story building with this kind of setback, with these kind of facades, and I don't really care about what's happening inside the building. And so in a situation where you're trying to build affordable, where a one bedroom might be 750 square feet to 1,000 square feet on the average apartment building, at Culpeper, the average one bedroom apartment, and it's about half one bedroom apartments, is about half that size. So in the same building, I can build 50% to 100% more apartments if you look at it as a building envelope rather than a number of units per acre. So that's a thing if in fact we want to encourage developers to build affordable units, we have to look at building envelopes rather than units per acre. I, I strongly believe that. And, I, and it's, it, it's, it's something that the form-based code does. The form-based code is designed to promote and preserve affordable housing. I think it does it. I think it does it well. I think other areas could benefit from that same model. And, uh, and I, I want to touch on parking again. Walter, I, I was delighted to hear that Walter went down from the, the, the affordable will take you down from a 1.25 to a one parking space per apartment, a one to one ratio. And he said he got down to 0.75. But then he mentioned what the reality is. In his building, only about half of those parking spaces are used. At Culpeper Garden, we have 340 apartments. We have 110 parking spaces. 110 parking spaces. Now, I think we're underparked. I, I would agree with people that we're underparked, and some people are parking on the street, and I, as a result, always park on the street. But there's something between a one to one and a one to a, a one parking space for every three apartments that probably does make sense. And not a third but maybe 0.75 or maybe 0.5 so that you can, in an affordable senior apartment building, get to a number that really makes sense and makes it much more affordable. So again, I just wanted to touch on, on these topics. We want to, uh, from an accessibility standpoint, avoid islands and that, that we're creating unintentionally uh, because th this, is, uh, this is necessary for people to be able to stay in their own homes, whether it's in a commercial corridor or outside of them. It's going to take a broad, multifaceted approach. And from a zoning perspective, we want to think about those two issues of switching from a units per acre basis to a building envelope basis and, uh, and not forget about that par all important parking ratio as well. Thank you very much. OK, this is going to be fast and furious. Okay, these slides are in your packet. I'm not going to read them to you. I just wanted to offer about a minute's worth of perspective. You know, how do we move from these discussions to an age-friendly community? I think part of it is really making sure that we're thinking big and thinking connections. You know, are we connecting senior, senior living to our great spaces concept? Here's our button, by the way. I hope you pick it up outside. It's not just for the millennials you know, who want to walk and hang out and do cool stuff. Senior friendly places are fr friendly for everybody. And all the research I've heard about shows, this is a little bit terrifying, I'm a boomer, that I am, my preferences are converging with millennials. <laughs> Not in movies. But seriously, we want to be walkable, urban, we're looking at small spaces, we're willing to sacrifice space for affordability in place, okay? So let's keep ourselves in the equation. I think of that first graphic I showed you, the really the most important thing and probably the biggest challenge is the whole idea of integrated planning. You know, all these other things around there we do in sometimes islands or silos as people like to talk about it. How do we make this all come together? Where does that plan happen? Oh, glad you asked. One of the things we have going on right now in Arlington is our affordable housing study. We're rounding third on this study. Clearly in the, uh, the analysis, the needs analysis draft, there's going to be a, a, a very important community meeting on Monday night talking about the needs analysis. You can see from the, the um, words I put in red, they know we have a senior uh, household challenge as part of our overall needs challenge, which as you all know are, is considerable. Um, here's the good news. Our community in the polling results 
This was the highest number that came up, the highest value. 92% of those polled, important to help seniors age in place, okay? 81% favor grants to people to help them with very low incomes, including seniors. So what does that tell you? The values are largely there, which we know. What, what usually we need to fill folks, and I've learned this in my work in housing the last four years, is the information. That's the gap, okay? And quite frankly, to, to have the exercise and the talk about the hard choices. We need to do it. But the values are there, and that is hugely important. Here's another bit of good news, in my opinion. Again, these are draft recommendations, but from one of the key working groups of the working group, look what they're talking about. We need to look at the accessory dwelling units. You know, we need to look at this kind of envelope approach that Hunter was talking about and Walter has talked about. We need to look at parking. So this group right now has out in the community draft recommendations. They need to be supported if we are serious about some of the concepts and issues we've discussed today, because I can anticipate there will be pushback about some of these concepts, because we haven't thought it all the way through. Uh, again, we talked about, uh, Terry especially talked about the, the plan that was put together almost 10 years ago. Lots of good things came out of that plan, but there are other recommendations that that group made that have not happened yet. You know, we have, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel, I guess is what I'm saying. We have a lot of good ideas that we've created in this community that are still on paper. We just need to go back and take another look at it. We also are very lucky. We have such great resources that we can literally bike to. I mean, you know, national resources, AARP, city county management, all the groups, um, uh, Janet's group who is with us today and has given our organization tremendous help. Lots of smart growth groups. We can bike to those locations. I mean, a lot of people in the country would kill to be in our position, I can tell you that. We also have great local and uh, regional groups that can help actually help seniors do things with their home, retrofit. We have the co-op extension, the 55 plus. What excellent sources of information. Uh, going back to Terry again, a lot of people don't know these great programs exist. We already have existing uh, a network, if you will, to get this information out. So I think from the little bit I know about senior housing and certainly the little bit I know about housing in general, this is the challenge right here as I see it. You know, how do we build a constituency to, to require the integrated planning? How do we make sure that we are looking at all of our assets? We've, we have in this room identified a lot of challenges and some of our assets. Are we gonna need new funding, for example, to have livable communities? Can we afford it? If we can't, are there other things we can do with our existing programs? You know, and finally, and this is why it's in bold, you know, who's accountable? Who is really going to make this happen? Who do we say we need to look to you? And you know, in fairness, if we're looking to a group or an individual, do we, are we willing to give that person or group the authority to make things happen? So those are just a couple of ideas that, as uh, some context to take away. We are officially at wine time. I'm happy to take a couple of questions um, for Hunter or, or Walter. Um, I think hopefully people can stay around a little bit. We have some great, not that I made any of it, great hors d'oeuvres and, and wine over there. Maybe a quick question. Fran Lunny. Yeah. What was the big reference to the CHDA uh, not having the priority for seniors when they allocate tax credits? I have to turn that question, the answer to that over to Mike Scheuer. Is he still here? <laughs> Mike's still here. I snuck out. It's a question we're going to have to ask VHDA based on some of the things we've done here today. In all of the conversation that I've heard about looking at the big picture, there's a piece that hasn't been mentioned. And what stimulated my thinking around it was both my first personal experience and uh, something I saw on, I think, the Washington Post this week, where Arlington was ranked in the bottom third of 150 cities, urban areas as a place for uh, retirees. 
why was it so low? It was so low because of the cost yeah. of living here, apparently. The other interesting piece that was in part of that statistic is that there's a much higher percentage of people over 60 still working in our world. And I think the reason is because a lot of us want to work past 60, not because we have to work past 60. But from my personal experience, I wanted to work past 60, but not full time. I wanted to get out of the way and make space for a younger person to come and work with that younger person. So to do to put that into this integrated planning part, what is Arlington County doing within its own government agency to provide part-time work opportunities for people at the last stage of their, of their career who want to work three days a week maybe, or work five days a week but half the day? Is the county supporting that? Because I think that will allow a lot more of us to live and retire happily. Go ahead, Hunter. I, I, you, you hit on a couple of topics there, and I'll try to take them both. Um, the, the first, uh, from an economic development standpoint, and I worked with Arlington Economic Development, the county does a great job. But there was, the question is, what is the county's role versus the private sector's role in encouraging part-time employment past age 65? And what can the county do to encourage the private sector to do more? Um, I, I think that, that's a question that the county, and, and we've got a couple of board members here, struggles with on a regular and ongoing basis. And I know people within economic development have continued to look at how do, you, how do you tap into that workforce that wants to continue to work, and in some cases needs to continue to work. And it, it's not an easy answer, and, and um, I think it's, if anybody has a suggestion, I, I think all of us would welcome the answer to that. The other question or the other kind of underlying thing that you said was that Arlington County ranks in the lower third of areas where um, seniors want to be or it can be because it's so expensive. And what you saw a after 2008, after the, the uh, stock market took a dive, um, the independent living um, in, in most urban areas, independent retirement living in most urban areas, went from occupancies in the 90s, often mid-90s, down to somewhere in the 80s. And what you saw was a migration from the urban areas, not just Arlington County, not just Washington, Baltimore, New York, Boston, up Philadelphia, up and down the East Coast. You saw people with, in that age bracket moving to different areas where the cost of living was less. So it wasn't necessarily something about Arlington County or Washington in particular, but you did see industry-wide occupancies dip considerably in the independent living as people chose to move to more affordable areas outside major urban areas rather than in them, particularly on the East Coast. So I, I, I'm not sure it's, a, it's an Arlington or Washington question as much as a urban affordability. So I'm going to ask us to take our other questions into the reception because they're starting to knock down the walls and it's going to be kind of hard to hear. I want to thank all of our panelists and our moderators again. I especially want to thank Joan McDermott from the Commission on Aging, who was just really fabulous to work with and appreciate all your support and help, Joan. Thank you.